It's a business that has seen blood and conflict. An industry laced with fear and loathing, apparently chaotic, unruly and largely unregulated. It's threatening a law unto itself. With millions of South Africans dependent on public transport, the government is not taking any chances. Hi, my name is Ayanda. Welcome to my YouTube channel. We haven't done one of these sit down videos in a while and I figured today would be the perfect time to have a deep dive into the South African taxi industry to figure out how it became the powerhouse it is, why it is plagued with violence and how it sustains the power that it has in the South African economy. Um, yeah, so that's what we're going to be doing today. If you like the video, please subscribe, please like it, please share it with your friends. If there are anything that I forgot to mention in the video, please mention them in the comments and let's get into it. Rival taxi associations have been fighting for ownership of a busy route. It's a bloody business shrouded in controversy, synonymous with violence. With more than 80 people killed so far this year, 24 of them in July alone. This is how brazen taxi wars have become. What does it take to survive in a sector plagued by violence and deadly turf battles? So to fully understand the operations and nature of the South African taxi industry, we'll, not, we'll need to start in the beginning. We'll need to begin at the start. We'll need to go back in time. So between the 1930s and the 1960s, the South African taxi industry was made up of small cars that could only transport a few people at a time. And it was only until the 1970s that the South African taxi industry, as we've come to know it, began wiggling its feet. It was illegal to operate taxis at the time, and black South Africans could not easily obtain driving permits. But there was a law in the apartheid laws that had declared that um, public transportation could be done through a bus, and a bus was defined by law as a transportation that could, well, a car that could transport 10 people at a time. So black South Africans that became taxi drivers found a loop in that law and began transporting people, only nine people, nine or less people in their cars. And that is how the South African taxi industry or the South African black taxi drivers began to operate the taxis under, well, it was not against the law. <laughs> they found a way to make it work within the laws that were not allowing them to drive taxis at the time. In 1981, the first taxi association in South Africa was established, which was SAPTA, the South African Black Taxi Association, which had aimed to unite the about 40,000 taxi drivers that were existing in South Africa at that time. However, as I was doing uh, research for this video, I came to learn that there were taxi associations that were already existing before that time. But I, I, I would like to believe that this was the first official gathering of taxi associations sort of um but papers are saying that in 1981 that's when SAPTA uh, the first official taxi association was established but as i was checking through other evidence i noticed that there were taxi associations even in 196 in the 1960s so take this information with a grain of salt you know with appreciation for the facts that i'm presenting to you um however for the most part the first taxi well for the sake of history cancelled or not yeah, the first taxi association in South Africa was established in 1981 and it was called SAPTA. And so because this was still during apartheid South Africa, there were still some places which black South Africans could not be at. Black South African taxi drivers could not park in certain areas and could not drive into certain areas, which prompted a, a resistance from the South African taxi industry. And they began to form an integral part at opposing the South African apartheid laws at the time, which angered the apartheid regime. Realizing how defined and united the taxi industry was, the apartheid government began getting concerned that the South African taxi industry would create political chaos, especially since it was an integral part of the political uprisings that were taking place at that time. They were transporting people to protest, they were helping people escape and to hide, and they were also just really against the apartheid regime. It was pretty evident that the unit of the South African taxi industry was going to be a problem for the regime. So to understand exactly what the future of the taxi industry meant for the regime and if the apartheid government should take stricter measures against 
um, the South African taxi industry, the apartheid regime had asked for asked for studies to be made by numerous government bodies that would look into the nature of the South African taxi industry and if they are a risk to the government. In 1983, a study by Peter Felchemut from the University of Johannesburg, then known as the Rand Africans University, made a report through his study that the South African taxi industry should be completely banned. A contrary review by the National Policy Study submitted that taxis should be allowed to operate but provided measures in which the taxis would be regulated in their operations. Another study by the Competition Board suggested that the taxi industry be completely deregulated. And while the South African regime was still debating on what they should be doing about the taxi industry, they were sleeping while the taxi industry rapidly grew. And by 1987, when the taxi industry became de deregulated, there were already about 50,000 taxi drivers that were existing in the country. And there were many more taxi associations that had formed and had been aligned with different tribes and different political parties. So we're now in the late 1980s. The South African government is laid with their laws and everything. In fact, no one even cares a damn anymore. The South African taxi industry is no longer crawling. It is running. It has affiliated itself with different political parties. Different taxi associations are affiliating with different tribes. It is every man for himself. Tensions are rising. People want Nelson Mandela out. On top of everything, no one is going to listen to the apartheid regime. So this is where program problems begin to arise because now there's many there's many text associations, there's many languages, there's many tribes, there's tribal wars, there's also political tensions and political wars between different political parties, between political parties and the apartheid regime. It is a spectacle, a violent spectacle, which was the perfect environment to breed what the South African taxi industry has become to be. So keep in mind everything that is happening at this time. Taxes are deregulated. SAPTA is losing its ground. Remember SAPTA? The first official taxi association, the horrid man of the taxi associations. Tensions are high and SAPTA began to have rules within itself that I think we're aiming to maintain the unity that was still in or that way they were trying to achieve within the taxi association and most people were not happy with SAFTA's rules it, it was just not making sense to them hence many people broke off from SAFTA and started their own um, taxi associations but something that is not worthy about SAFTA SAFTA man ugh. SAPTA, I hope I've not been saying SAPTA the whole time. Something that is noteworthy about SAPTA's rules is that to this day, rules of taxi associations supersede every other rules, every other rule that taxi taxi drivers follow. There is no other rule in South Africa, South African taxi industry, that can be above that of the taxi associations. It is what the taxi in fact, it is only when the taxi association says you must comply with the South African law that taxi drivers comply with the South African law. That's an interesting note to keep. So now, now we're in the 1990s. It's nice. 1990, political parties get unbanned. Nelson Mandela is released from prison. It is nice. In fact, taxi drivers transport people for free to go see Nelson Mandela. It is a happy day. Freedom is coming tomorrow. 1993, you know what happens. 1994, first democratic elections. But there's something else to keep in mind. Why am I speaking like this? <laughs> Here's what you should keep in mind. During that time between the 1990 and 1994, before the first South African democratic elections, the taxi wars were out of control. There were political wars between the ANC and Ingata Freedom Party. And, you know, it was just, there was a lot of tension in the air. And most of the fights were through the taxi associations. That is when you see the strength or the power of the influence that the taxi industry has in the South African public and the danger that it is actually. So in fact, most of the violence that is associated with the taxi industry matured during the early 90s. So this is what is something that you must also keep in mind as we proceed with this video. Let's go. Can you guys believe it's in the middle of the night? This is like 2 a.m. Ah, uh, let's get into the video. Now you have the apartheid regime which gave up power because there was a lot of tension in the world. People were tired of South Africa's apartheid and they were telling the apartheid government, if you don't release Mandela, if you don't give those black people the freedom, we are keeping our money from us. 
and the anti-apartheid sanctions were on top of South Africa. Now, the ANC government inherits a South Africa that is essentially broke because, well, the sanctions are there. In the 1980s, South Africa was attractive. Gold was at its highest. It was beautiful. It was worth a lot of money. But when the sanctions hit South Africa, gold was essentially worth nothing. Now, what does that mean? It means that the majority of the black men that were working in the mines were no longer going to go to work. Now, what that does mean? Oh, what does that mean? <laughs> You see, every time I speak, I need to take this seriously. I need to take this seriously. Okay. The black men are no longer going to work because the South African economy is struggling. Meaning now we have a problem of oversaturation. There is more taxes in South Africa than people to transport to work. The NC government is new. There's nice vibes. They are trying to establish order. They are promising black people all these opportunities that exist with a government that looks like them. But the honest truth of the matter is that there was not as much money as people thought there was. And with the new democracy as well, people expected things to keep happening. I mean, even when I was reading some of, of, the, of the articles, people would say that when Mandela was released from from prison and after they voted for the for, for the first time, they expected to become millionaires and to become rich and all of that because they'd seen how white people had lived when the, the world was led by people that looked like them. Now, they had high expectations about what South Africa would look like under black leadership, but there's no money. Now, it's the late 1990s and the early 2000s. The South African economy is still suffering. The taxi wars now are becoming even bigger. They are no longer about political wars and everything. They are about the roads. Who drives on which street, on which road, in which town? What language do you speak? Where are you from? So that, has, that is what actually has come to define the South African taxi industry. Even today, certain taxis cannot drive in certain places. If you speak a certain language, you may not drive in certain rent, taxi rents or certain towns. There's general acceptance of the rainbow nation as we've, as we've come to know it. But there's also the underlying truth to say that sometimes if you are found at a certain place as a taxi driver and you speak a, a certain language, you may be in a bit of trouble. Also, if the sticker on your, on, on your taxi, because the taxis have the taxi association stickers, if your sticker is saying long distance and you are picking up people that are not traveling long distance, stuff like that, those things were caused by the oversaturation of the market. Many people, I mean, many taxis, many taxi drivers, not many people, not many economic opportunities. Now there is fight over the rent. You get it. You get it. Another thing that we must note with the apartheid regime is that they were able to be as successful as they were because they were a minority, a minority that was stealing from the majority. When you have a new government or a democratic government that aims to equalize everyone, that is minority, majority, everyone should be at the same level. If, I mean, if the pie was this size and it was eaten by three people, now the pie is this size and must be eaten by 15 people, 15, 50 people. I mean, really. Do, do you understand it? And there's a lot of arguments that are made by South Africans. Oh my God, infrastructure during the apartheid regime was so much better. Oh, I miss the apartheid regimes. What, but people, what people are not understanding is that the infrastructure at the time was only for white people. How do you say the infrastructure at the time was better? I mean, how do you say the infrastructure was better during apartheid when Black people did not have access to water. Black people did not have electricity. Black people did not have roads. Are you saying the infrastructure was better because Van Vig and his family were hoarding millions and millions of rents and were having access to 24 hours of water and electricity? Was it better because white people were having a good time then and black people were suffering? I don't understand. What is the reasoning behind things were better during apartheid? Nothing was better during apartheid. Our people were seeing flames. I mean, we're still suffering from the repercussions of apartheid to this day. And people have the audacity to compare the apartheid regime to democracy. How dare you? Yeah, because no one crosses the taxi driver. Because we don't know what they're hiding and what we're doing or some bomb or something. <laughs> so we're feeling safe when we can. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. But
some call him dry Sene, some call him Mageza. If you're not South African, it's driver to you. <laughs> He's South Africa's most notorious driver, infamous for bad driving, and the most hated driver in this entire country. He does not follow the rules of the road. Everything is as he says it is. They can shut down economic activity for days on end until their demands are met. Nothing comes between a taxi driver and his money. And it is a well-known fact that if you are even short with one rent or one cent, he can kick you out of his car. That's the general perception of the taxi driver. In fact, there's an ongoing joke in South Africa that if you want anything done, you should call taxi drivers. They have become that sort of a, per a person sort of people they have become those sort of people in the country people that get things done stubborn follow no rule other than that of the associations and their bosses sometimes <laughs> <laughs> Here, scores are often settled through the barrel of a gun. And not just in Cape Town, across the country. Amateur video clips show just how ruthless this industry can be. In Johannesburg, a taxi boss is shot in the head at Point Black Range. In the same city, a taxi boss is ambushed in a hail of bullets in a failed hit. And in this clip from Kabecha, a gunman crosses a busy road with a semi-automatic rifle, letting rip in yet another taxi assassination. In 2021, 123 taxi-related murders were recorded. So far this year, there's been shootings every single month. We have the men behind the men. They are the taxi owners. They live lavishly. They are very, very rich and they are heavily armed. They either have guns on them or they have guards with them. They are notorious for ending people. You know, ending people. Yes. So this is where the leaders of the taxi association come from. When you have a lot of taxes, maybe five, six, seven, I think even if you have three, but three is two, you're speaking small money. Most of them have more than three taxes and they rarely drive taxes even. They have now graduated to driving their own cars, have not been in a taxi maybe even for a couple of years. Very, very, very strict people. Most of the turf wars that happen, happen between them. And because they are the leaders of the associations, you know where this is going. If the, 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 the taxi owner is in an association and they don't like another taxi owner that's in another association, it's very easy to find justification to end them, especially if, especially because most of the time the fight is over money. The killers factor their expenses into the price. If, if you want money, we must charge more money. Because if you want money, obviously you're going to drive expensive cars like a uh, Golf 7, blah, blah, blah. Even us, when we buy the car from uh, the hijackers, we must buy the, the car who can speak like Golf 7 and stuff. So obviously the money go hard. What do those cars go for? Uh, we negotiate uh, uh, with the cars because if the car is dead, you're going to uh, uh, use it once and burn it after it. So if the car is like Golf 7, if the car is 25 grand, when it's hot, then maybe they will. No, who will say? Me na am na inke na me na ente ni funa imad. And how did it make you feel? You must not miss a chance. So when you that day when you decided to to take your your your, your kids to school or your wife to, to 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 work, it's your loss, you know, because it means when you leave you, it means you must like follow another imad. You see, the, that month's gonna cost another hundred k, you know. So you don't have time to see that today you are alone or you with your kids, you are blah, blah, blah. because they don't want to give away the money, they don't want to hire, they don't want to give companies, you know. But I can't blame them because there's no one advising them that they listen, maybe tomorrow you will die. If your hit is what's going to be 300,000, because now you've got bodyguards and stuff, it's going to be times two, because now your bodyguard may fight back. Was there anyone that, that ever that you may have been involved in killing that that just wasn't the, the target? Uh, actually, yeah. You see, even if you don't want to do it, but because you're not alone, there's no time of telling the next person not to do it. 
you know, you know. So relax later. Say these children, say these what, what, say these wife, say these what, 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 what. You know, this thing happened so fast. You can't just look in the car. Who's there? Who's there? Who's there? When you follow the car, you follow the car. Once you get the chance, you. Masak fingi lo usga njalum gaiensa gaiensa. It's like play. It's like playing. It's like a sport. Yes, it's like a sport. Do you have any regrets about what happened during those years that you were working in the industry? No regrets because I went there with open minded to go see. I was going to kill people for money. Is in Gabi. Now it is not clear at which point these people get began getting associated with the taxi industry, but my guess would be during the first initial stages, during the first initial stages, during the initial stages of the taxi wars that were taking place, the war, the, the TEF wars and everything. I think that is when the taxi industry or the taxi industry in fact became infiltrated by people other than those that were aiming to provide services through transportation or the taxi industry you know found these people to help them eliminate their competition that's the only yeah that's the only reason that i can come up with the only justifiable concreteish reason that i can not reason link that i can find between izingabi and the taxi industry they are called hearted killers and have been associated and have been linked with many other especially high profile well i can't say especially high profile because they kill everyone that they come across that they're contracted to kill but in south africa there's been various high profile cases in which taxi drivers and ingavis were linked to to them matters of politicians of soccer players uh, athletes and you name it you bring the money they're gonna get the job done for you so they are a key proponent of what the taxi industry is to this day. Ite mang figa gusini wa echeli la kuluma ate ah amaposa ambulal enengatola veli. Was with him on the day he died and noticed a police van following them wherever they went. Wang tajer from Melukshini se town. Something strange about him there. La poke mi na zangi notice. Benga benga book next. I veda ma police. I logi a try. Yes, like this, do they try last corner corner? I'm gonna go near Vel. I don't know, I'm not a cousin of a poison piece one. I'm trying to get me now. I think I'm not a poison. I'm saying as well. I didn't mean I took them. I and the Taguko Jungle Bush calling this or when they are like it. I as a gamble. He says later they parted ways, but when he went back home in the evening, he was informed that Bongani had died. Here, the police, the prosecutor and taxi bosses are suspected of collusion. The Amersfoort police station is accused of allowing impunity relating to taxi violence. Residents insist that the police station is a family business because the station commander, Delisi Letwala, is married to the captain at the same police station and the investigating officer, Samgele Bushase, is the station commander. In addition, the town's only prosecutor, Mr. Nkonde, is also accused of having connections in the taxi business and is apparently conflicted when it comes to taxi-related cases. The South African community does not have a good relationship with law enforcement in general and i think i should probably read up on this but i think apartheid has something to do with it you know just a wild guess you know the police black people police law enforcement you know power dynamics stuff like that black people don't they don't respond well to the police and the general perception of the police in south africa today is that the police are lazy they're inefficient and they are corrupt so it should not come as a surprise to know that some of the police have been accused of being in cahoots with some of these criminal elements in the taxi industry hence it is very rare to find cases where matters are resolved and are resolved to the satisfaction of the public and the the, the, the satisfaction of the victim and the victim's families in fact i have never heard of a case where is in Gabi were involved and they got convicted. I'm sure they are there, but because they are so rare, where cases where 
people are found to be guilty in the taxi crimes and people are contracted to kill and they are associated with the taxi industry and they are convicted especially because they are usually also affiliated with very influential people within government and the police service and all of that so yeah I, i'm just waiting to see if you have any evidence of cases where is in gabi were contracted to kill and the police did a thorough job i'm happy to receive the evidence and i'm happy to change my perception and yeah that's that's who they are the police the police are the police people in south africa don't have faith in the police for general things even when it's not the cases of his Gabi, the police are known to not be doing their work to the satisfaction of the public at the top of the South African taxi industry food chain, this is where you find the Hrotmans, the Ngamlas, the bosses of the trade. These are the leaders of the taxi associations. They run the show. Every little thing that happens in the taxi industry comes from them. They determine which taxis drive where, how many taxis are on which route, which taxis belong where, how much is the price of a trip to here and to there. Look, every single thing that happens in the taxi industry comes from the taxi association. In fact, if the small and young boys under there tend to defy the, the, the rules of the taxi industry, well, they don't always get killed, but it's very easy for you to no longer have a career in the taxi industry if you don't take orders well, especially orders from the big men. And the fight is very relentless. It's basically you kill or you get killed. Survival of the first test. The fight for the South African taxi industry pie that is worth 90 billion rents is relentless and is chaotic. But take a step back from the noisy chaos and something else emerges. A minibus taxi industry that's surprisingly organized, meticulously run, often with an iron fist. There is a general agreement in South Africa that things cannot proceed as they are. Taxi drivers cannot continue to hold as much power as they do. They cannot continue to not pay taxes. They cannot continue to basically hold South Africa hostage whenever they want something from the public. But the interesting thing, though, is that I do not... Oh, also, people believe that the... the, 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 the South African taxi industry should no longer be private, it should be a public entity and all of that, which are things that are well meant, but I don't think are going to happen um, at this particular point. They don't want to pay taxes. They claim to also be, I mean, they're making plus minus 90 billion rands and that they are not wanting to contribute to the South African economy through taxes and they're claiming to contribute through the economy uh, by fuel levies and through VAT. So you are seeing the negotiations are not going to be easy and I don't think they're going to happen. I mean, these are people that are making, they're making a lot of money, but they also cannot allow other forms of transportation or other modes of transportation to take place in South Africa. I've read that in some areas, it is impossible for, for staff transportations or school transportations or any other form of transportation other than taxis to operate in in a certain time period like in the morning when people are going to work you can't drive your work car to work because there's a taxi the taxi industry the taxi drivers are going to stop your car they're gonna harm you they're gonna make sure that you no longer drive in that area anymore and we've seen this with ubers as well taxi drivers do not want ubers they attack uber drivers all the time they don't want the industry to be you know <sighs> i'm wondering exactly how the discussion to publicize not even <laughs> Exactly how the discussion to involve the taxi industry legitimately and thoroughly into the South African economy will look like. They're already getting away with taking so much money and for not contributing enough to the South African government. I don't think they would be able to want to have a discussion that would involve them paying more money to the government or contributing more to the country's GDP. I don't know. That is where things are, 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 that's how things are seeming to me. If you have a view that you think is contrary to what I believe and maybe an idea of how you think the South African taxi industry can better contribute to the South African economy and how they can, uh, you know, collaborate with law enforcement and co collaborate with the general laws of the Republic because they, they really are behaving as though the rules do not or the laws do not apply to them. So the future looks like it's going to be a bit tough for a little while. I don't know what change would require or what, what, what would require of us or of the, the, of the taxi industry to have different conversations and to have, you know, safer and 
better discussions around safety transportation you know the economy the money you know yeah that's 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 my view so with that said i'm also of the view that there are other elements of the south african taxi industry that are a success story the way that they coordinate their business the way that you know even you know there's a general idea that downtowns in every city is not safe but in downtown wherever there's a rank there's general safety amongst the people. People rarely ever feel like they can, anything can happen to them when they are in the presence of taxi drivers because, well, taxi drivers are known to be very violent and are very protective of their, of, of their customers. And, you know, there are things like that. Even when you, you can transport a child from here to there, 500 kilometers away, and they would arrive safely due to the, I know, I, I can't say the kindness, but <laughs> taxi drivers are able to ca take care of, 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 of children like that. They're able to take care of people that don't know directions and, and all of that. And, you know, sometimes, especially when you are a full-time taxi passenger, you, you grow fond of the way things are done. And, you know, if I'm, I'm of the view that if taxi drivers were to form a political party, they could have a lot of support because they seem to be people that get things started and get things finished. If you want to be in a position where you feel safe and you feel like, okay, this is going to happen, it's when you're at a taxi rank or you're in a taxi because chances are the, the taxi driver is just eye on the ball. Whatever you want, he's going to get it done for you. So, yeah, there's, there's a little appreciation for the work that they do and the way they've been able to coordinate themselves, even despite, you know, the challenges that they face. Um, and I think in order to have a functional taxi industry, we must not just look at the taxi industry as it is. The violence that is emanating from the taxi industry is not just the result of taxi drivers being greedy. There's also the truth that within the societies that these taxi drivers come, for, come from, there's not much functionality. You know, we like to joke where I come from that, well, in fact, I was telling one of my friends, one of my nephews said, you better not become a taxi driver because he'd been spending so much time around taxi drivers. And he's around 19, 20. And that is the general success story in places where I come from. That when boys matriculate or they drop out of school, they eventually just become taxi drivers. And once you get in, it's very difficult to come out. But we should start asking questions of why the boys are going to, to the taxis. That's the easiest job market that they can enter. And they usually know someone that's already a taxi driver. All they need to do is just to chill with them for a few months and then they get their own taxi and then they start working. But when every boy from disadvantaged backgrounds becomes a taxi driver, it means the taxi, the taxi industry continues to be saturated. It means they will continue to be tap walls because there's too many drivers and there's little money. So how do we address the entrance or the desire by young boys and young men to enter the taxi industry. We would need to look at a, a plethora of things, including the education gap between uh, boy children and girl children. How much attention is put in each or both genders of children uh, pertaining to their education? Because most of the time, it's the, the, the emphasis is made on girls, focus on books, leave boys alone. And there's really much interest into the education of boys and even when they drop out there's not much um anguish from the society there's not much anger that look in this community we've lost five kids they've dropped out they they're no longer coming to school or they failed their metric or they've passed their metric but are not proceeding to 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 to, to get better jobs or to go into university and that also has to do with the responsibilities placed on young men as well that you must be the man of the house you must have an income you must be this man that can provide and all of that and poverty yes has a lot to do with it but also our disinterest in to the in the individuality of young men of young men as they are i think it has a lot to do with 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 them eventually just resorting to quick money making quick money making scheme although i don't think the taxi industry is a quick money making scheme because those taxes are expensive hey i was looking at them they're like around six hundred thousand now a car so yeah i i think let's address because uh young women don't drive taxes hey they are well there could be one or two but for the most part it's young men and most of them have dropped out of school so address the the, the distance the gap between boys getting educated and getting into the job market other than that of of the taxi industry if we aim to address 
the taxi in the violence in the taxi industry of course this is not the only reason but i'm very very convinced that if we were to put an emphasis on educating boys and ensuring that they remain in school beyond remaining in school that they are the pressures by society for them to become men is reduced i think we can we can have some sort of a success in in eliminating some of the violence that exists in the tax industry Thank you guys for watching this video. I I knew it was going to be long, but I didn't think it would be this long. Thank you for joining me. Please share. Please like it. Please comment. All of those good things. I'm going to see you next week. Uh, have a good one. Good. Do I say good night? Okay. It's, it's, it's 4.30 a.m. Good morning. Have a good day. And yeah, let's keep engaging. Uh, send the evidence through. Thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye.